Hi, and welcome to Codex. Our speaker today is Wojtek Shaya, who is a professor at the University of Maryland and co-director of the Norbert Wiener Center, also one of my doctoral advisors. Professor Shaya is an expert in harmonic analysis and its applications in fields like remote sensing, biomedical imaging, and data science. Today, he will tell us about Fourier scattering as efficient feature extraction. Take it away, Wojtek. Thank you, Emily. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be able to talk to, to, to this esteemed audience. Thank you and all the other organizers for, for, for the invitation and for the opportunity. And that was a really long introduction. I've never got a longer one. Uh, so let me start by saying that what I want to talk about is a joint work with a number of great people. Uh, they include Wei Lin Li, Ilya Kavalerov, and Mike Pencala, who, who, who were former graduate students of mine at University of Maryland, and my former colleague, Rama Chalapa, who, who, who recently has moved to Johns Hopkins University. So the talk about uh, scattering transformations that I would like to present to you today is, is, is deeply motivated in the recent lessons we have learned from data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and other applications, modern applications of mathematics. First of all, we have learned that, that, that there is actually a lot of data, which I have to admit that at some point to me, it, it, it was not so obvious. I remember as a graduate student trying to, to, to find some digital images uh, that I could process for my dissertation. I needed to knock on quite a few doors in the engineering department and find someone willing to, to, to share a couple of interesting or useful digital uh, photographs. Now, obviously, there is an abundance of data, and, and, and that abundance, of course, is, is, is not all bad, but there are other issues associated with that abundance of data. It's non uniform, it's collected by different uh, devices using different modalities, differently represented. There is lots of noise, errors, coding, and other issues. So this, this data that, that, that we now have everywhere is actually very difficult to, to, to process. And so developing mathematical theories, which will help us understand how to best process this data, that, that, that has to take into account all these called nuisance factors which affect our understanding of the information content of the data. And so we want feature extraction for various applications that is information preserving, regardless of, of, of those nuisance factors, but also invariant to, to, to a broad array of, of different actions uh, that depend on the modalities and applications we are interested. And that is needed for, for some very common tasks, such as data classification, domain adaptation, generalization, etc. So specifically for the task of classification, which is one of the simplest things we, we, we can really do when we talk about data representation, the feature extractors that, that, that we would like, they need to do a number of things. On the one hand, they, they, they obviously need to be able to separate different classes, but separation of different classes can happen in, in, in different ways. And not only that, they also, for, for, for per better performance, should group the samples that are within the same class in, in, in some improved way. For example, by compressing the samples in the directions in which our labels do not vary. Uh, this is something that deep convolutional neural networks have been in the past few years demonstrably very good at. And so trying to understand why that happens and building mathematical foundations for, for, for perhaps new, better ways of, 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 of doing this feature extraction is, is, is the, the, the idea behind this talk. And this is something that was first proposed by Stefan Mala in, in, in his seminal paper on group invariance scattering in 2012 and following work, one of which is, is, is a very intriguing paper in the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society on the understanding of deep convolutional neural networks. But there is, of course, a broad, broader and richer history, which I think one should really go back to, to, to the concept of 
wavelets or the continuous wavelet transformations, which are defined as a representation of the signal through a family of dilations and translations according to, to, to this uh, hopefully familiar for, for, for everyone formula. And it was Stefan Mala in, in 1989 who, who, who proposed a theory for how to take advantage of these continuous objects and to, to, to define the so-called discrete wavelet transformation. Uh, this discrete wavelet transform has, has, has been evolved over time. For example, Yves Meyer, Ronald Kaufman, and Victor Wickerhauser developed it into the so-called theory of wavelet packets a couple of years later. Uh, another couple of years, and Emmanuel Candes proposed, uh, intriguingly motivated by the, at that time, developments, new developments in the theory of neural networks, he, he, he proposed the, the, the concept of the ridgelets, and then together with uh, David Donohoe, they, they introduced the curvelets as an enriched idea which uh, equipped basic wavelet transformations with directional sensitivity. Uh, and then the work of Mala evolved from, from, from these around 2010, 2012, leading to, to, to this paper on group invasion and scattering. And the, the, the main contribution that I would like to mention in, in, in this talk that, that, that belongs to Wei Lin Li and, and, and myself is the concept of the Fourier scattering, which builds on Malat's ideas. But before we do this, uh, let me say a few words about what is Malat's approach and the philosophy behind switching from discrete wavelet transformation to, to, to this scattering transforms that, that, that he has proposed. So the idea is that if we, for example, would like to introduce the invariance to translations, we can do this mathematically by convolving or averaging the, 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 the signal with a low pass filter. Small diffeomorphisms, which are also common features or, or, or nuisance factors that we would like to be invariant to, uh, they require something a little bit different. They, they require uh, separating the variations uh, of, of, of different variables at different scales. And that can be done with, by convolving with, with the wavelet functions. But the results of the wavelet convolutions, they have this problem that they oscillate. And so averaging them again with the scaling functions outputs negligible terms. And so the, the, the somehow revolutionary idea that Mala proposed in, in, in his scattering transformation paper was to introduce a nonlinearity, which in this case takes the form of a very simple modulus of the coefficients. That, that, that simple solution fixes this, this, this problem uh, where we lose information by averaging with the scaling functions. And this gives rise to the idea of combining iteratively convolution with the scaling functions uh, and wavelets later, interchanging this with this nonlinearity and this way building the information at each scale by adding another stages of, of, of scale separations, which perhaps are best illustrated by, by, by this picture from, from, from Malat's paper, which shows the structure of the very rich scattering network, much richer than typically we are used to when we talk about wavelet transformations. And on the right hand side, you can see uh, the display of the scattering coefficients, which are partitioned into appropriate sectors depending on the parameters in, in, in this very rich scattering network. And so we, we, we see both scale, location, directional sensitivity, everything building up into one a uh, very powerful feature extraction. Formally, one can think here of, of, of paths of, of coefficients which, which, which are representing these uh, iterated stages of convolutions interchanged with nonlinearities. And so we have paths of length one, paths of length m, and then the collection of all possible paths through this possibly infinite very rich network structure gives rise to, to, to Malat's uh, group invariant scattering 
that has been motivated by wavelets. So what happens with, with, with Malat's idea is that now we, we have the ability to, for example, uh, linearize the, the, the translations, marginalize the, the action of, of additive diffeomorphisms using the, the, the concept of the scattering transformations or, or, or scattering coefficients. And this has been a very powerful tool that has been studied by a number of people. And I'm only giving a few names here, uh, obviously of Mala, Bruna, Irene Walsburger, Matt Hirn, Radu Balan, Pierre Emmanuel Robin, Gilad Lerman, and many, many others have followed in the path of, of, of this very intriguing transformation of feature extraction technique. So with such a rich structure, uh, very powerful and, and, and very useful, which, which, which has been demonstrated to work very well in a number of applications ranging from image processing to, to, to uh, molecular chemistry, why would one want to change anything and why would one be interested in uh, coming up with new principles behind scattering. Well, so our motivation was to, to try to introduce uh, new types of new types of frames which, which, which generalize the concept of Gabor frame. We call them uniform covering frames, and they will be formally defined in, in, in a couple of slides. But effectively, what we are doing is we are giving certain hierarchical structure to, to, to otherwise uh, rather non, typically non-hierarchical Fourier or, or, or Gabor system. This hierarchical structure for, for, for wavelet theory, the so-called multi-resolution analysis, we, we were very used to because it's naturally associated with the concept of scale. When we talk about translations or modulations, so time and frequency shifts, uh, this, this, this ordering is, is, is not necessarily natural, but there have been a couple of instances where, where mathematics has provided intriguing interpretation of, of, of time frequency systems in this hierarchical manner. So I want to mention my colleague, Zemovi Dershotnik, who over 20 years ago proposed a method to, to, to build the analogs of, of, of the MRAs for given Gabor systems by adapting the wavelet dimension, so-called dimension function, and, and, and structuring the, the, the Gabor system according to, to, to the properties of this dimension function. On the other hand, a couple of years ago, Zhu Wei Shen and his collaborators showed a very different construction of digital Gabor filters, which also have an MRA structure. Uh, uh, but they used the uniform extension principle of Ron and Shen to, to do so. I also want to mention that Jama is well known for not publishing some of his better results. So his work is, is, is only a communication that, that, that does not exist on, on paper, but feel free to contact him if you're interested in what he has done. So the uniform covering frame that we want to present here is going to, to, to take the form of a sequence of functions, functions defined on the d-dimensional Euclidean space, which and indexed by a family of, of accountable uh, parameters, which we will define precisely later, which satisfy a number of assumptions. There are some technical assumptions, like for example, we want uh, our function f not uh, the analog of the scaling function to, to, to be integrable, square integrable, to, to, to be continuously differentiable, to have the Fourier, sub, Fourier transform, which is supported compactly in the neighborhood of the origin, to, to, to have the modulus of the Fourier at origin equal to one. We also want some regularity for the other functions. We want them to be integrable and square integrable and uh, impose some constraints on the support of the Fourier transformations. Most importantly, we want the 
frame property. Uh, we want to assume that for all arguments xi, the sum of the Fourier values at xi for the whole collection of our functions fp in, in, in the uh, modulus squared adds up to one. And finally, we want the uniform covering property, which states that for any number r, there exists an integer n with the property that each element of our family has the support of the Fourier transformation, which can be covered by n cubes of side length equal to two times r. Then, with each multi-index p, uh, we associate a bounded operator following the prescription given here in the first step. We are convolving the input signal with the elements of our family fp, and then we iteratively apply the, the, the same idea uh, where convolution and the nonlinearity taking the form of the modulus of the of the value is applied time after time. And so the resulting collection of functions, uh, which is obtained by convolving them with the elements of our family, uh, that's what we call the Fourier scattering transformation. So, so, so in some formalized mathematical sense, it's an operator which acts on the space of square integrable functions and produces uh, the square integrable sequences defined as, as we see. The name Fourier scattering, perhaps not very obvious, and I must admit that I think it wasn't obvious to, to, to us for quite some time. We, we, we were looking for, for, for various interpretations of, of, of this uniform covering property that, that, that leads to the uniform covering frames. And in the end, we decided that the fact that the convolutions with elements of our family contain very well localized information about the frequency content uh, of, of, of the resulting functions that, 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 that warrants the, the, the name of a Fourier scattering transformation. So this Fourier scattering transformation satisfies a number of, of properties. Uh, first and foremost, the, the, the definition directly leads to the interpretation of, of, of the Fourier scattering in form of the uh, semi-discrete Parseval frame for the space of square integrable functions, which is effectively the, the formula given here. Uh, one of the important aspects of so constructed transformation is, is, is this non-expansive nature, which is emphasized by this inequality when we act with the Fourier scattering on two different functions, the, the, the difference can be easily controlled by the original difference between these two functions in terms of the Euclidean norm, which is just like the above uh, concept of a semi-discrete Parseval frame. This also is a direct consequence of, the, of, of having the frame identity as, as, as part of our, our definition. Similarly, we can use the, the plancherel parseval formulas associated with this frame concept to, to, to show that our scattering transformations, they preserve the energy. That is the, the, the norm of the output is equal to, to the norm of the input. But much more importantly, especially from the perspective of applications, which I'm hoping to, to, to be able to mentioned at the end, uh, exponential energy decay is one of the crucial elements and, and, and properties in, in, in our field. Uh, this, this, this exponential energy decay, which, which, which mathematically is written in, in, in form of this inequality in bold, which controls the sum of the squares of the coefficients in, in, in our Fourier scattering family with 
a uniform constant that depends on 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 the on the level in 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 our network structure in the form of this exponent and 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 just the norm of the input function and nothing else this is something that will prove very important in applications the, the, the ability to, to to demonstrate that the energy uh, is concentrated at, at at few and 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 top layers of any kind of network you would like to you would like to construct and that this energy decays exponentially quickly as as, as you proceed to 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 farther and farther layers in your network obviously has 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 practical applications that that, that cannot be that cannot be uh, overlooked and especially in the context of, of, of recent applications of scattering transformations in the forms of scattering networks for 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 deep learning so here the exponentially the exponential energy decay is a consequence of 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 having the uniform bound uh, on 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 the structure of the supports of the localizations of the Fourier or frequency content of of the elements of our frame, which then we translate into the form of lower bounds on the scattering features, and then the bounds can be proven to, to, to be obtained with constants which are independent both of the level at which we find ourselves and the path we chosen to, to, to reach that level and that in the end provides us with this uniform uniform control on the remaining energy after after a number of k k steps now going back to 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 the going back to the invariances that we would like to study mala and 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 his collaborators they they, they emphasized two types of invariances uh, one is the invariance with respect to translations and the other with respect to additive diffeomorphisms so translations obviously are, are, are a very common operation in, in, in many applications and in many applications we would like the results of our experiments for example when it comes to studying the, the, the classification questions uh, to, to, to not be dependent on, on, on how we how we shift or rearrange our our data and so the property of being contractive with respect to small translations which uh, controls the translation by the gradient of, of, of the scaling function, of course, by the norm of the, of the input function and the magnitude of the translation in, in, in the linear way. That, that, that's something that, that, that is going to, to, to be one of the key features of the resulting Fourier scattering. In order to prove this kind of inequality, we use the commutation of the translation with convolutions and nonlinearities to, to, to shift the action of translation onto that scaling function f naught, which then allows us to take advantage of Young's inequality and also fundamental theorem of calculus, which justifies that uh, continuous differentiability assumption, which we made earlier to estimate the terms that, that, that involve the difference between function f naught and its scaled copy and the uh, exponential energy decay mentioned moments ago is, is, is one of the key factors uh, together with the uniform covering property which tells us that our uh, supports of the elements of our system may overlap but always uniformly and, and, and we have the same number of elements overlapping uh, regardless of the localization, which is something that, that, that separates this, this, this type of approach from typical wavelet approaches where uh, you may imagine even a single function scaled down and up by, by, by a range of factors in, in, in such a way that, that that will introduce arbitrary large overlaps or rather overlaps between arbitrary large numbers of elements of your, of your system. Another example of 
nuisance factor that, that we wanted to consider was this concept of a small additive diffeomorphism, which very often we, we, we may think of as, as, as some additive noise or, or, or other, uh, other uh, element which distorts the data through, through, through the, the, the various processing stages. And so for this contraction property, uh, we take advantage of, of, of a result of Viatowski and Bolchkai from 2016, who showed how uh, one can use the, the, the Schuh's lemma to, to, to obtain this, this type of result. Uh, one last thing I want to briefly mention is uh, that our uniform covering frames can give rise to, to, to Gabor frames, which, which are uniform covering frames as well, uh, by taking appropriately constructed scaling function and replacing it, that function of not, uh, adding this, this, this condition, which guarantees that the Fourier content of, of, of function G is uniformly distributed with respect to to, to, to the lattice of translations, and then modulating our function G uh, and employing the Fourier scattering mechanism takes this system and builds a new system, which happens to be an example of, of a double frame, non-uniform double frame uh, associated with, with, with the translations imposed by our construction. Another element of, of, of invariance that, that, that's very popular and common, especially in image processing, is rotational invariance. And I just want to mention that rotational invariance can be introduced to the scattering setting by using uniform covering frames, which are generated by finite groups of rotations. So one can. Uh, very, very, in a very straightforward manner, introduce uh, finite rotations by, by, by factors associated with integers m. Uh, and this way, we construct our first stage set of coefficients. And then we build paths from, 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 these, from these individual pieces by, by, by applying the uh, scattering principle that, that, that led to the construction of the uniform covering frame. And this way we can build uh, functions which look like this and naturally uh, provide us with, with, with some uh, optimism when it comes to trying to, to, to use these systems for various image processing applications because they, they clearly are embedded, they, 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 they have the, the, the property of, of, of the directional sensitivity, which typical Fourier or Gabor systems don't necessarily have. So uh, maybe to, to, to briefly illustrate the difference between the classical uh, Fourier scattering and the rotational invariance Fourier scattering, let me just mention that uh, this, this, this picture at the bottom I, I, I think does it best, the, the, the classical structure of the locations of the translations uh, associated with the original Fourier scattering transform is on the right and follows this obviously rectangular simplified path, whereas the rotational invariance that incorporates the, the, the finite numbers of rotations at each scale modifies the, the, the structure to resemble a little bit more that, that, that structure we saw in the uh, one of the first slides where we were looking at the structure of uh, Malat's and Bruna's rotational invariant wavelet scattering coefficients. So the properties that I mentioned earlier for the classical uh, Fourier scattering transformation, which, which, which it was not rotational invariant. All of these properties can be restated for the rotational invariant Fourier scattering, and 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 they are all aggregated here. I will perhaps skip the details for the sake 
of time, but also because this 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 is in some sense repetitive when 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 compared to to, to our previous observations. We, we we do see the energy conservation property. We still have the non-expansiveness, the, the, the contractive property of the scattering uh, feature extraction. We have the stability with respect to translations, and we have also the stability with respect to additive diffeomorphisms. And on top of that, we have rotational invariance respect to rotations from our finite group of rotations that was used to define this, this version of the Fourier scattering. So with this Rotational scattering, I just want to mention that, that, that uh, the concept of curvelets of Candes and Donohoe, which in some sense was a very natural directional extension of, of, of wavelet construction, makes us think that, that, that the rotational uniform covering frames can be viewed as the time frequency counterparts of curvelets in, in, in the context of time frequency analysis and, and, and some theoretical uh, analysis of directional time frequency representations. We, we, we have done a couple of years in this paper with Ben Manning, James Murphy and Kevin Stavis. Of course, this, this, this grew to, to, to be a very large field on, on, on the one hand, Fourier scattering transformations have been very successfully applied to, to, to a number of, of, of problems that I have mentioned earlier. On the other hand, people have built very interesting variations of, of, of scattering transformations that, that are different from original Malat's work and also different from the Fourier scattering that I have just, just, just introduced. Especially, I, I, I would like to mentioned the, the work of Yatoski and Bolchkai, who in around 2015 introduced this, this, this generalization of, of, of how to think about scattering transformations in terms of semi-discrete frames, and then finally discretize that, that, that work a year later as part of the representation at ICML. I also want to mention uh, specifically when it comes to discretized transformations work of, of, of my former student, Mike Pencala, who showed that, for example, crystallographic hard type composite dilation wavelets could be used to, to, to construct their specific uh, crystallographic analogs of, 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 the, of the scattering transformations, which lead to, to, to some of these very intriguing pictures of, of our hero, which you can see below. But uh, because the title of the seminar has not only expansions, but, but, but it also mentions the applications, I would like to spend the, the, the last uh, 12 or so minutes that I have of my talk to, to, to introduce to you some very natural applications for, for, for this theory, which I believe show the, the, the strength of this time frequency analysis when it comes to data processing. One of the reasons for this is that I occasionally realized that when I was a graduate student, I have been brainwashed to, to, to think that wavelets are the solution to, to, to every problem we have when it comes to image processing and that Fourier transformations are, are, are a distant second tool and, and, and not something that, that, that should, be, should be used in, 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 serious, in solving serious problems. But that is not really true. And there are many instances uh, where time frequency analysis shows its strength and, and, and shows that, that, that even in problems related to image processing, it can dominate uh, the solutions proposed by, by the wavelet or time scale analysis. So one such example, which, which, which is perhaps not very common in, in, in the mathematical community, but, but is a standard bread and butter 
for the remote sensing community is the concept of hyperspectral imaging. So to, to, to very briefly explain what a hyperspectral image is, it's a generalization of a standard color image, which commonly we accept as a three-layer data set uh, consisting of the red, green, and blue frequencies. And, and, and of course, the, the, the visual representation, what, what we see on the screen of a computer, that, that, that structurally has a form of a very small data cube with, with three layers. And the concept of a hyperspectral image builds upon this and introduces the possibility of having as many layers as, as you wish. Of course, that, that, that as many is, is, is only theoretical in practice. There is always a certain trade of that we have to pay because the number of photons that the camera can collect is always finite. So when you try to introduce multiple wavelengths, which you would like to measure, you obviously are sacrificing the resolution of the imagery you are going to collect. But these hyperspectral images, they prove to be an invaluable tool when we try to analyze some of the more physical properties of the object we're looking at. Here we have an example of, of a hyperspectral data cube or hyperspectral image, which uh, is an overview of, of, of a certain area of, of, of the Earth looking from far away from a satellite. And in each individual image, we can see the, the, the distinct physical features of, of, of what we are looking at. But more importantly, when we look at each individual pixel in this data cube, that pixel is not a number, it's not three numbers, it's a couple of hundred dimensional vector, which has, which represents the, the, the physical properties of the actual object that, that, that the camera is, is looking at that location. And so if you're looking at uh, organic materials, they, they, they will have their own distinct spectra. If you're looking at mineral materials, they, they, they will have their own spectra. If you're looking at water, it will have its own unique spectrum. And this idea of looking at, at, at images from the perspective of the physical properties of what we're looking at, which are encoded in form of spectral or, or vectors of spectral representations of these materials, is what makes the, the, the Fourier scattering idea to, to, to be uh, very intriguing and, and, and useful. And of course, any other time frequency approach. Is, is also going to, to, to be well applied in this, in this context. So let me show you a couple of examples of what one can do with Fourier scattering and, and uh, these, these types of images. So first of all, I want to mention that, that, that engineers very quickly uh, caught up on Malat's work and already in 2015, there were examples of uh, scattering transformations being applied to, to, to the problem of hyperspectral image classification by taking advantage of the specific three-dimensional scattering wavelet transform uh, that, that, that results from Malat's construction. And the authors of that paper, let me skip a couple of other slides, the authors of that paper showed us how three-dimensional scattering can be used for classification of these three-dimensional cubes. The first picture we, we were looking at is a pseudo-color rendering of, 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 the, of the area uh, somewhere in Indiana that, that, that we are looking over with, with a satellite. What you have in this very clean picture on the right is the distribution of the labels of pixels which were actually carefully investigated by an expert and identified as corn, grass, soybean, 
woods, uh, stone, towers, or other structures. Everything that, that, that's black has either not been identified or there was no, no clear identification of, of what we were looking at. And so remembering that in this color picture, each pixel is really 200 dimensional vector, we can take a random small sample of, of, of the data as training and we can train a simple classifier to, to, to try to distribute that information, that knowledge about labels hidden in the training data to, to, to all of our data. And if we do this to, to, to the raw spectral vectors, that is the, the, the original vectors in the hyperspectral image, uh, we actually can do quite well. The, the, the picture we see in the very left corner is, is, is perhaps not perfect, but a lot of areas are, are, are modulo some noisy after uh, effects. They, they, they can be easily identified with, with the classes of, of plants that, that, that the farmer might be interested in. One could, of course, similarly to, to, to analyzing the spectral content, process that spectral content using one-dimensional wavelet or one-dimensional Fourier scattering and then just assemble that information uh, through the, again, a simple classification that, that, that is based on measuring the proximity in terms of, in angular terms between different vectors. And, and, and we could improve in some situations slightly the, the, the results we obtain are relative to, to, to the raw spectral processing of those vectors. But the key strength of the method that, that, that we, we are using is not in separately identifying each individual pixel vector, the, the, the spectral vector associated with, with, with particular material we're looking at, uh, but it's in the total processing of this data as, as, as a data cube. And so very naturally, uh, there are two aspects of it. One aspect which we don't see, this is this, this, this spectral direction that is interpreting each pixel as a vector and processing that pixel uh, naturally with the Fourier scattering because we, we, we do know that these spectra are rather smooth and if there are any discontinuities, there are usually the artifacts of, of, of processing. Whereas the two-dimensional nature of the image associated with this hyperspectral imaging asks for treating it with the two-dimensional wavelet scattering transformation and the, the, the results produce a stunning difference, the, the, the 98, 97% success rates associated with the most naive uh, one nearest neighbor classifier to, to, to de-emphasize a little bit the number gain, show the, the, the strength of Fourier scattering or, or in general of scattering coefficients uh, as, as, as a very powerful tool that, that, that can be applied in, in this context. But what is more interesting is that we can actually generalize the concept of, of a Fourier scattering to, to, to build an analogous three-dimensional Fourier scattering network that, that, that will be specifically adapted to this data. And this is a very simple three-layer network that, that, that we are illustrating. Uh, here in the first step, we are convolving the data with our filters following by nonlinearity and max pool. We do this twice more, then we concatenate the data in form of this rich cube by taking advantage of the max pooling again. And the resulting transformation actually beats, somewhat surprisingly, the combined Fourier wavelet uh, transform uh, applied uh, in, in, in the previous images to, to, to this data. And so uh, this, this, this shows the strength of the Fourier scattering which is not surprising considering that all of those spatial features we see are really the results of contrasts 
that are present in the data between the, the, the various spectral features that, that, that are describing what, what we are looking at. And so Fourier scattering dominates other techniques, both mathematical techniques such, such as classical double systems, but also the state-of-the-art neural network approaches, which, which, which have been heavily trained and, and then combined with sophisticated classification schemes. Uh, and I think this, this, this example is perhaps uh, a great opportunity for me to, to, to stop, skip a couple of slices and just mention that, that, that this work that I presented here shows various possibilities and, and, and tells us that we shouldn't necessarily uh, take for granted some, some, some embedded uh, standards for, for, for various applications. Each type of application has, has, has its own associated uh, structure which can take advantage of different mathematical constructs. And so hopefully wavelet scattering, Fourier scattering uh, are just first steps and, and, and one can hopefully see in the future many more examples of scattering transformations that take advantage of different invariances and do this for the purposes of different applications and solving different problems. Uh, with this, let me thank you very much for your attention. And uh, perhaps now I will, I will be able to, to, to answer the questions that were in the, in the chat or any other questions. Thank you very much. All right, let's everyone hit that reaction button.